um, writing in the chat, um, kind of get an idea of what you guys already know and go from there. Sound good? Let's see if I can advance this. All right, so first things first, please log on to Poll Everywhere so that we can get this thing rolling. I'll give you guys a couple minutes. Or text, either one. All right, hopefully you guys are in there. Aha, so somebody's already answered. Have you guys learned about heat stress before? I'll give you guys 15 seconds to answer this. Okay, we have some no's. All right, oh, a little more. So we have a uh, 80, 20, I was about to say 75, 25, 80, 20, that's good. So it's really gonna be an interaction kind of going off of everybody together, learning from one another. There's a bajillion ways and signs and each dog's a little different, but we're gonna talk about kind of the most common as we go through. So how comfortable are you with this topic is our next question. Brian, you're not allowed to answer this one. <laughs> okay, good. You guys can see the results, right? Judy? Yeah, yes, we can see them. Thank okay. you. All right, great. So nobody's never heard of it, which is fantastic. Um, Heat stress, stroke, exhaustion, heat-related re injuries are critical and part of DOG 101, which we'll get into a little bit um, in our next slide. So our outline is what dogs are at risk and why they're at risk. Uh, what is heat stress, heat stroke, heat exhaustion? Um, what this kind of looks like, we're in a practice. So I'm gonna show you guys a couple of videos and a couple of photos of what a dog would look like. And you're gonna tell me what signs you see and what kind of intervention we think we should take what you should do if it happens. And then most importantly, it is preventable. So it's about educating you guys and everyone who owns a dog, what these signs look like so that they don't progressively get worse and the dog gets hurt. So if you have any questions, please, please ask. This is going to be very interactive. The more interactive it is, the more you guys learn, the safer the dogs will be. So please, please, please um, feel free to mention anything. All right. First question, how do dogs exchange heat? I think this is a type in question. Panting. Panting. Mouth, okay. All right, awesome. I think the fact that it keeps getting bigger is good. Pause a little bit. Yeah, we'll talk about that. Anybody else? All right, excellent. Panting is the correct answer here. So dogs exchange the most heat via panting, which is why when we talked about airway, allowing them to actually exchange heat and pant is most important. Um, they don't sweat like people, so they don't perspirate through their skin to exchange heat. There is a small amount of heat loss through their paw pad. So if you see a dog that's really hot and they're walking around, you'll actually see their paw prints on um, either asphalt or something that they're walking on, meaning that they're hot, but that is not a primary mode of getting rid of heat. All right, so what dogs are at risk? Obese dogs. Um, so as you guys can think about it, the more weight they're carrying, fat is an inflammatory process, the more it's kind of insulating and keeping them hot. So obese dogs are definitely at risk. Brachiocephalic dogs, so our smushed face dogs, our French bulldogs, our bulldogs, some English bulldogs, our Boston terriers, um, anything that kind of has a smushy face are at risk because if you can think about it, they don't have as much surface area to exchange heat. Um, airway problems, so Yorkies um, with collapsing trachea, where their trachea will kind of go up and down and they have a uh, uh, decreased exchange of air 
Uh, laryngeal paralysis is common in our Labradors. That's where a little flap in the back of their throat kind of hangs down. And that again, exchange uh, blocks the air exchange there. Um, poorly acclimated dogs, that's meaning like, so in a USAR world, if a dog from Massachusetts goes to Arizona or Florida or Louisiana, they're obviously not as acclimated to that type of weather and are thus more susceptible to getting heat stress, heat stroke, heat exhaustion. Um, high drive dogs. So basically every dog at the center. Um, I bring this up because these dogs work over everything is how they operate. So even though they're hot, even though they can barely breathe sometimes when they're on a bite sleeve, they don't care. That is what they want to do. So as a trainer, an intern, a volunteer, it is critical that we look out for the benefit of the dogs because they won't look out for themselves. So even though they're on a bite sleeve and they're still pushing and fighting, they might actually collapse on the bite sleeve from lack of air or from being so hot. And we'll talk about that a little bit. But all of these dogs are high drive dogs and work over everything. So we have to make sure we pick up on the subtle signs to intervene uh, before anything bad happens. Um, and then a dog that has had heat stroke before. So there have been a couple studies, especially out of the military, Dogs who have had previous heat stroke are thus predisposed to have it again, um, usually from the damage that happened from the previous um, component. So it's important that we prevent these from ever happening so that our dogs go out. And if they ever get, if they get heat stroke at the center, they are then predisposed to get it in their working career. So us not paying attention to them and their heat could actually impact their career and their health uh, moving forward. So that's why this is such an important topic. So this is a very busy slide. Don't get overwhelmed. We're going to go over it a little bit and kind of do case examples. But these are the three different types of heat uh, related injury. So it starts with stress, then it exacerbates to exhaustion and then eventually stroke. And the point of these is we're really going to harp on the stress part because we never really want to get to the exhaustion or the stroke part because both of those are preventable. So I'm really going to focus with you guys on the stress so that we don't have to even worry about the exhaustion or the uh, stroke because we dealt with it already. Does that make sense? Um, so stress, slower gait. Um, if you're playing retrieve with the dog and they're running back to you, running back to you, and then all of a sudden they start to do this little loop around and then they're starting to kind of staying away from you or they're taking a little longer to out their ball. Those are all signs that they're getting overheated. If they start to look for shade, so you're out in free run and then they start laying along the fence line and there's some shade there. Um, if they're looking for water or going after the gross puddles, um, persistent panting, so that constant panting, but they are able to stop. So they're going, <laughs> but then they stop and they go, <laughs> and then they stop. That's kind of in the heat stress category. And we'll talk about what that looks like with exhaustion. Um, loud breathing. So their panting will not be very audible. Uh, scooped tongue, which I'll show you some pictures of because there's different levels of scooped tongue. Um, squinting or pulled back eyes. You'll start to really kind of see the difference there. Again, we'll show you some photos. Uh, reluctant to command, and this is not them just being stubborn. So knowing the dog is very important. Um, whether they usually do a down and don't do a down or a sit or a come, and they're kind of avoiding you because they are so hot, they don't want to do something. Um, and then usually they have a general increase of anxiety because they're hot and they're not paying attention to yeah, they're a little concerned of what's happening. So that's what the general anxiety is from. Now, if you ignore all those signs and they or don't catch them for some reason, they'll progress. So the next level would be exhaustion. Well, this is where the dog is consistently panting. They cannot stop panting. Um, and a good way to test this is if you were with a dog and um, obviously remember safety, if you waved a toy in front of their face or a piece of food in front of their face or you even blew on their face, they should close their mouth and pause a dog that's in heat exhaustion cannot close their mouth they will just consistently keep panting because they need to get rid of all of that heat so that is a difference between excessive panting and they can stop panting by closing their mouth or they're excessive panting and cannot um, they will be less responsive to you meaning interacting with their environment not just commands so a dog that is in heat stress will still kind of like acknowledge that you're here that you're there if you said come on good boy they would look at you or good girl um, less responsive, meaning that they kind of start to ignore you that you are even there and they're kind of ignoring the fact that the world exists. They're just so focused on the fact that they're hot. Um, and all of these things I'm saying is in the relative context of like um, walking around or playing ball or doing agility. In bite work, this looks very different. 
Um, and that is a whole kind of tif different category that we can go into because most of these things you'll only see the eyes and you'll only see the ears. Um, you won't be able to see their mouths because a bite sleeve will be in their mouths. Um, and the panting, you'll start to see labored breathing. So it's a little harder in the bite work context, uh, which is why it's important to kind of pay attention to these next photos and the little details. If I'm getting nitpicky, it's for that reason. Um, as well as they'll start to show a staggered or a drunken gait. Um, so when they're starting to walk, their hind end will kind of like wobble to the side or they'll have a misstep. Some dogs will even um, kind of like fall into a down as opposed to a gentle laying down. Uh, they will start to drool. Their uh, gums will start to turn this bright red and some will even have muscle tremors, which um, there's a debate in the veterinary world whether they, that belongs to exhaustion or stroke, but it's kind of irrelevant at the moment. Um, and then the really bad one, the one that we want to avoid is stroke. That's the one that can lead to death and is a 911 run to the vet as soon as possible. And we'll kind of talk about the steps before that um, as well. But the, what you would see in stroke is the dog would collapse. It would become completely unresponsive. So it, completely ignoring the fact that you were there that doesn't know where it is in the world. Um, they typically have bloody blowout diarrhea and Vicky, there's no pictures of this, so don't be worried. Um, they will typically vomit, uh, they might even have seizures, excessive drooling, so excessive amount of uh, saliva coming out. They'll get this glazed over look on their face. Um, they'll have bruising of their skin and gums and sometimes their ears, so these little red dots everywhere. Um, and then eventually, if this is not appropriately addressed right away, it can lead to death, which is why we're talking about it and why we are talking about it, um, addressing it early so we don't even have to worry about these stages. So I want you guys in the chat, if you can all open the chat or unmute your microphone, either one, I want you to tell me what, based on the things I just said, what you think Blitz here is showing, what signs, and what stage you think he might be in. Okay, Sue says stress beginning. Good. Curling tongue, very good. Yep, so he's definitely got that tongue coming out, starting to scoop a little bit. Heat stress, squinty eyes, tongue can be unscooped. Yep, so definitely thank you, Lauren, for bringing <laughs> attack, a <laughs> cute attack of handsome. Yes. Definitely handsome. <laughs> um, so I like to point out that, can you guys see my mouse if I bring it up there? No, I can't either. Okay, never mind. Um, so his eyes, we start to notice, if those of you that know Blitz, they don't typically squint like this when he's just kind of hanging out in his kennel. Um, they're starting to actually get that squinted up appearance. His ears are still forward, which is good. You'll start to see as they get more and more hot, their ears will actually start to come back, pulling their whole face back to help expand that area to exchange heat. Uh, another thing to kind of look at um, on their, on these photos are their mouth. So you can kind of see all his teeth, but when they really start getting that like huge grin is when they start to get even more hot. So these are important things to keep a lookout for. All right, good job on that one. All right, next one, Hawk. What do we think of Hawk? And you guys can unmute your microphone if you want to. Either one. Mouth further back, yep, Helen. He definitely is a bit wider mouth like I just described. Scoop, yep, definitely scooping. Now scooping is also a little relative, I will admit. Some dogs scoop a little more than others. Um, and we'll see a picture a little later of a golden who has a scoop tongue that is not in any, oh, disclaimer, not in any really heat stress. Um, so it's kind of gauging on that. This is definitely a scooped tongue. And the reason they scoop their tongue is that it actually expands all those blood vessels on the other side that helps even exchange heat even more. What else? Anyone notice something about his ears, his eyes? Okay. 
Eyes look a little wide. So they are a little wider than Blitz's. And again, it kind of goes, this is a perfect example of not every dog will show every sign in the same pattern. So Blitz's eyes almost squint faster than everything else for him. Uh, Hawk's ears go a little back further and he gets a bigger smile before his eyes start to squint. Um, so it's also very important to pay attention to your dog and kind of what they do first. But good point, Lauren. All right, we're going to move on from Hawk. Um, I would put him in not heat. He's like around heat stress. We'd start to start to be a little more concerned about him. Um, keeping in mind, he's actually wet. I don't know if you guys can tell by the photos, but I think this was a boat trip um, that Shelby might have taken. So he's already uh, cooling a little bit with the wet uh, fur, which we'll also get into. All right, what do we think of this golden retriever? And no, this is not Riley. Looks normal. Yes, Sue. <laughs> he, this is a completely normal dog. This is probably just a dog that's happy to be outside. Um, the reason I show this is guys, I want you guys to get an idea of what normal looks like. Again, if I keep showing you abnormal, it starts to all get a little mushed. So I need you to kind of reset and look at what a dog who is normally just has their mouth open looks like. So this dog is, their ears are forward, their eyes are nice and round and normal. They're not smiling extensively. His tongue's out or her tongue's out, but it's not scooped. So this is a completely happy, relaxing dog or chillaxing dog as Lori says. All right, what about this golden? Easy tongue. So this is a perfect example of a dog that has a scoop tongue. He's starting to get a little bit of a squinty eye, a little bit. Yep, starting to squint, perfect, Lori. Um, so this dog, again, is not in heat stress, approaching it. So showing a couple of those signs, but not quite there. This will be a dog we're starting to pay attention to again, but not really take any interventions for. And the reason I keep bringing these, these cases to the forefront, because these are the ones that I want you guys to catch first. These are the most important so that we're not getting to the horrible ones because like we talked about, this is preventable. So we want to make sure we catch it early and make adjustments in the beginning before we have to do with something that's really bad. All right, what about this dog? And this is Papa Bear for all of you guys that remember the hymn. Scoop tongue, starting to squint a bit. Yep. Ears are back. Perfect, Sarah. Yeah, his ears are really pinned back. That is not a normal stance for him. Saliva. Yep, you can start to see a little bit of the saliva building up, kind of on the end of his tongue, too. Facial tension, long scoop tongue. Yep. So you also start to see um, there's been a couple studies in a military study that showed their teeth. So these little, these back molars, you normally don't really see them if a dog's just kind of hanging out or panting. The more hot and more air they need to exchange, the more and more you'll see of all these back teeth. Um, so that's another sign. So you can start to see his back molars. Um, on top of that, this is actually bare after a hydration study that we did. This is about, I believe, 25 minutes, 30 minutes after. So he had actually gotten to a temperature of 108. Um, and this is kind of about 30 minutes after that. Uh, so just goes to show it's a gradual process. and it, But it also can happen very quickly. And we'll kind of talk a little bit more about that after this uh, next photo. But thank you guys for bringing up those points. Very important things to look at here. All right, what about this dog? Squinty eyes, mouth super side, huge tongue. Okay, I agree. 
What classification would you guys put this dog in? I know you can't hear him. Uh, as you can probably imagine, he's probably panting quite loud. Uh, he is sitting down. Tongue and gums, funny color. Yep, they're definitely brighter. Red gums. Yep, Mary. Molars. Yep, Anne-Marie, good job. So what do you guys think this dog is in? Do you think he's in stress, exhaustion, stroke? So Lauren, I agree. He's somewhere between stress and exhaustion. It's kind of hard to tell because we don't know if he sat down because he um, kind of, you know, just started to sit down for himself, if he fell down, whether his responsive are, so that is the limitations of a photo versus a video. But you guys have it nailed down perfectly. He's somewhere between uh, stress and getting close to exhaustion. Um, he probably would find shade if he could put himself in there or she. Um, so very good. Do you guys, I hope you guys see the subtle differences between these photos because they're very important for moving on and identifying it in a dog. Granted, like I said, it's a photo so you don't get the full experience. I do have one video that I hope works. I tried to get a couple more, but YouTube yelled at me for licensing purposes. All right, what about this guy? Squinty eyes. Yep. Good job, Kristen. He's got really squinty eyes. His are actually to the point where he, they're almost closed. So he's starting to get a little bit of a, I would say, sleepy or kind of out of it. What do we know about his ears? Molars. He's actually laying down, so this dog's fully laying down, and I think his elbows are a little splayed out to the side. Yep. All right, so what category would you put this person, or person, this dog in? Exhaustion. All right, Helen, yep. So again, it's kind of hard to tell based off of a photo, but this dog's probably somewhere between stress and exhaustion. Um, it's kind of flirting in that little gray area there, but it's important to identify these signs. And again, I'm sorry, it's not a video, but I think now I'm gonna try and show you guys a video. So give me a second, I have to not share my screen. If anybody has any questions right now, this is a perfect time to throw them out there. Feel free to unmute your radio too, or um, microphone. Can you guys see this? Yes, we yeah, see, a, we see picture. a picture. Does it show like Facebook in the background? Yeah. 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 Sweet. Okay. I hope the video works or the audio works, but this is a video that was posted of a uh, dog. You actually can read the caption down there showing signs of increased uh, thermal stress. And I want you to tell me uh, what you see in this video, because this is exactly what any of your dogs at home would do. They're just outside playing ball. Um, and this is what you would start to see. Note the weather, so it's quite shiny, it's a nice day. So I believe the owner is asking for the dog for an out, and this dog normally has a very good out and um, immediately lets go of the ball. So the dog's avoiding her. The dog's looking away. 
She starts to lay down when the handler did not ask her to lay down. You can notice her breathing right there is pretty, uh, not labored, but a little more extra effort. Uh oh. Oh no. Oh no. Oh, that stinks. Did it freeze for you guys? Gone. Gone. Oh, yeah. bummer. Okay. Well, in the rest of that video, you'll actually see that the owner throws the ball again, one more time, about the same distance, and the dog runs after the ball and actually collapses. The dog falls down and then uh, tries to get back up, stumbles a little bit, and then lays down and just starts panting. Um, and then the camera cuts off because they go to chase after the dog, obviously, to address them. Um, so what, and it can happen that quickly. Um, I'll tell you guys a little bit of story about Emery's dog at the center um, after this. But you notice that dog was panting in the starting of the video. Then she threw the ball and the dog came back and you started to see a little more signs, which I want you guys to um, tell me about. And then in the next ball throw, the dog collapsed. Um, what is, and it can happen that quickly. So it's not just a kind of fluke of a, an example. That is how quickly a dog can progress in heat. Where is this photo? Let me try and get back to the screen here. Anybody have any questions? That is not what I wanted. <laughs> Wrong presentation. Please hold. All right. Can you guys see the PowerPoint now? Yes. All right. And you see the one that says stress, exhaustion, stroke, that guy? All right, perfect. So Sue, great question. <laughs> On to our next slide. What do we do when we start to see these signs? So we start to see stress signs. The first thing we do is we stop. We stop training, we stop playing ball, we stop doing whatever it is that we are doing. Um, we move the dog either to shade or inside to let them cool down. We allow them to pant. Um, and then we want to provide them with some water. So some, a bowl of water, um, don't let them excessively drink, but intermittently drink. And then we want to make sure that they have some airflow. So this is not the time that we go throw the dog in the crate of a car that has no windows open or no air conditioning on, preferably windows open. Um, and just let them sit there in a hot box, essentially. Basically, now you put them into a sauna. What's important is that we take them away from the heat. We give them a chance to cool down, give them some water, um, and let have them have airflow. If it's just the stress, so very low key, nothing truly happening, um, they will be able to cool down on their own. You can put some water on them to help them cool down or throw them in the pool. It will help ex um, accelerate the recovery process. Um, but if you don't happen to have any, what's most important is you get them out of the sun into the shade and with some good airflow and then um, maybe some bowl of water if you have it, uh, depending on their accessibility to water. At the center, we will have pools set up on any hot days. So there will always be a pool available. We have hoses, we have the sink. You can send somebody to go get some water out of a bucket or a bowl. Um, there's always jugs of water at all the training stations, or at least they're supposed to be um, for in this kind of event. Now, if there's exhaustion, so we're at that next level, the dog can't um, stop panting. They're getting hotter and hotter. It's important that we move them again out of the shade or out of the sun into shade into a cooler area. We soak them down with water. And when I say soak, I mean get down to the skin. And you want to soak them everywhere, but your key goals are their head and their chest and then their belly in that order, starting to think in like their armpit area, uh, thinking about the most important places. So their brain is the most important, their heart is the most important. Um, and then, but if you have the ability to get them in the pool, obviously soak them everywhere. But if you have a limited amount of water, those are the places that you're gonna focus on. And getting it down to the skin is the most important. So for Vicky and Daphne, that's a lot of fur to get through. It requires a lot of water. So strategically doing so by parting the fur and, get, or, and getting down to the skin and then pouring the water is better for our shepherds with a thick coat, same thing. We all know that if you pour a little bit of water on them, it just kind of beads off and then that's a waste. 
So make sure you're really getting down to the skin and soaking them with that water. Um, other things, you can use some towels also to help them get down to the water for their um, alcohol on the um, pads, paw pads. It isn't really shown to do anything and it's not very effective. So in these types of cases, I wouldn't waste my time doing so. Um, these skills, like we talked about with Brian, we, we divided them by level one, level two, level three. Level one being everybody, level two being the trainers. This is a level one skill. Um, if there's in heat exhaustion, you should be calling a trainer. A trainer should be told. But you guys need to know how to cool down a dog because this can happen very quickly anywhere. Uh, Emery's dog prior who came to the center who spends most of his days in air conditioning and is hanging around, so not acclimated very much to the heat, um, came to the center a couple summers ago. One of the volunteers or interns lovely took him out to go play tennis with a tennis ball. They were playing uh, fetch, and I think they threw it maybe five times, and by the fifth throw, Pryor had collapsed on the ground. So that is how quickly things can happen, especially on days that are changing in um, heat. So a day that it's 50 degrees out, and then the next day it's 70 degrees out, those are huge jumps for our dogs, and they're not ready to do those types of things. Like us, they can't just change their clothing that they're wearing. Um, so they need to be acclimated to the temperature. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. I'm jumping ahead, sorry. <laughs> so for exhaustion, those are the things that we would do. Make sure there's a fan. Airflow is extremely important, as well as soaking them everywhere. Now, if it unfortunately progresses to stroke, but we get to that level where they start to get neurologic and collapse and the bloody diarrhea and the vomiting, this is a absolute emergency and life or death situation at this point. At this point, you should be calling a trainer. You should be soaking the dog. It should be getting in a car, not in a crate. I would actually probably just hold the dog in the back seat and make sure that you're cooling them and the windows are completely down so there's airflow and you're going to the vet because this is a you need intravenous fluids and hot, like high quality uh, veterinary care for this dog to make it through. Um, so that's why we are trying to avoid stroke because this is the one that could kill the dog. And again, we went through all of these different steps to identify heat stress and heat exhaustion early so that you guys hopefully never have to worry about stroke or even see what it looks like because we've been now been educated on how to identify it early and intervene early. All right. Um, one of my slides I think got deleted here. Uh oh. Hold on, guys. So one of the graphics, I actually went online and kind of Googled what you would see if you guys happen to Google heat stress and what you would find, as I think that's important. Um, this was a great graphic from Murdoch University. It's a little busy, but it kind of gives you an idea of all the components of um, uh, heat stress or heat related injury. Um, it kind of talks about all the different pets. There's a couple guinea pig and ferret recommendations on here, which I actually didn't know. Um, so if you're interested in that, that's something that's different. But what's most important here, um, I know Shelby asked me recently, what is a good way to acclimate our dogs? So for the days that it jumps from 50 to 70, other than exercising them in the morning, expecting less of them, so only doing a couple ball throws, keeping an eye on the fact that they, uh, for these signs, making sure that they're fully hydrated before they go out, and again, doing activities not in the heat of the day, so the middle of the day or early afternoon or early evening, try and reserve activities for the morning or the very um, nighttime. Um, those are probably the best things to do right away for those days that we do those drastic heat changes. Uh, whenever we get back to the center, fingers crossed, we will start to change the temperature in the kennel. So the kennel area will be a little hotter than everybody else. We will leave windows open and doors open so the dogs get acclimated to the temperature that's outside. Again, it still takes a decent amount of time. I think a couple studies have shown it takes somewhere between two and three weeks to do for a dog to fully acclimate to temperatures. And as we all know in the Northeast, that's quite hard when we have days that jump from 50 to 70 like they're about to do or the uh, vice versa. Um, so we do the best we can. Uh, uh, Brian uh, and Dr. Otto and I are trying to look into uh, actual better heat protocol for our dogs to hopefully acclimate them faster or more efficiently. But in the meantime, the best things that we can do is educate you guys on what heat stress looks like, what heat exhaustion looks like, and things to do, um, as well as how to treat it. 
and then kind of moving on from there. Um, Helen asked, will the dog be non-responsive at the stroke level? Yes, the dog will be non-responsive at the stroke level. Um, it will most likely be on its side, panting, maybe even vomiting, and just have a glazed over look and not respond to anything. Um, if they might even completely fall, fall unconscious on the way to the hospital, depending on what level they're in. Um, this graphic I can make you guys available in the chat or uh, Vicky or Judy can send it in an email, but it kind of really covers all the points that I talked about. Um, I'm sorry the video didn't work as well as I wanted it to. It really is quite dramatic. There's a couple good videos out there in the internet that are quite graphic about um, heat stroke, which I didn't want to interrupt your lunch, but it shows a lot of bloody diarrhea and vomiting. Um, there's a really good hunting video that I couldn't get, but it shows the dog going, kind of going in circles, going in circles, and then collapses and lays down. Um, if you take a look at that video, I highly recommend it, and you'll see that the owners actually put the dog in the crate, which is, I first I was wondering why they did that. That's not the best move, but I realized the dog wouldn't stand still. So they actually put the dog in the crate, soaked the dog with water, opened all the windows, and they had fans in the car, so they blasted the air, which was all appropriate, and they ran um, to the vet because the dog was in heat stroke. Yes, Lori, I can share the infographic. Yep. All right, I think that's it. Sorry, the some of the technical things didn't work out, guys. Um, if you have questions, please feel free. Um, I'm probably going to show you guys some of these photos again when you show up at the center. We'll do real life examples when you're with the dogs. Um, hopefully trainers, you guys can point out certain times when the dogs are really exerting heat stress and heat exhaustion. Uh, I almost took a video of my own dog because he almost went into heat exhaustion or stress this week um, with the hot 70 degree weather. As you guys know, he's fluffy and does not like the heat very much. Um, so, but I couldn't focus on cooling him off and getting a video at the same time. So I apologize for that. How can you tell if they are getting heat stress in the water? My dogs swim endlessly. Great question, Sue. So that's kind of like bite work in that you should, well, whenever the dog's swimming anyway, you should always give them a break in between. So you should, <laughs> hold on, Brian. Um, you should always kind of give them a break. So every time they bring the ball or whatever you're playing with swimming, um out make sure they're kind of you know able to still swim in the water monitor those signs for each stress so how they're panting what their tongue looks like but the most important things to look out for what while they're swimming would be their ear position and their eye position so whether their ears are fully back or their face is stressed um, and their eyes being squinty so in this picture if you take a look at it um kai who's the dutch shepherd on the right is actually got a little bit of a squinty eye but she kind of always looked like that um, so knowing her is also important. Uh, but if you look at Sirius, who's the Labrador on the left, he's just a happy-go-lucky dog, and he's doing okay, too. And monitoring how quickly they are going is very important also. So if you start to see a change in how quickly they're moving or if they're staying toward the shallow end and um, kind of going that way. But the water is helping cool them down. So a pool is a great way to keep them cool. And Brian brought up the point, was there something not right with this photo? There are a couple of things not right with this photo. This is actually the very first Margaret's trip that the center ever took. And those of you that know Margaret love tennis balls. So she, that's why there's tennis balls that hurt their teeth. And I believe Sirius is, is probably too small for his mouth and he's going to choke on it. I think Kai's might be a little bit bigger. Any other questions? And I also can make those um, sign um graphic of all the different signs of heat stress stroke exhaustion available for you guys so you can know i'll have judy send it around so you can kind of get an idea of it um in the summertime we always post pictures of the dogs and what those signs kind of look like all throughout the center so you guys don't forget mm -hmm. i have a I question, have a question. Yep. yep does Acclimation stick with the dog at any point throughout their life? Like if the dog grew up in Florida for the first few years of its life and then moved, would it keep that early acclimation to heat at any point? That is a great question, Bridget. Um, I'm not sure if anyone actually has looked into that, that I know of. 
Um, I, if I was going to make an educated guess, I would say no. I think if the dog left Florida, lived its whole life in Florida, left Florida for a week and then came back, I think they would be okay. But if they lived in Florida their entire life and then moved to Colorado and lived there for the next three years and then went back to Florida, I would say no. But Cindy or Brian, if you want to jump in, I don't know of anything like that. Yeah, that's a great question. This is Brian. I do wonder kind of the epigenetic portion. Is there something that does stick there? But from my knowledge, uh, no. And I think it's best if we treat acclimation really as a takes you about a month to get it and it goes away pretty quick too. So it is definitely kind of like cardio, pretty quick to gain and pretty quick to lose. And you can't assume you have it. Yep. Uh, Jenny said, from my personal experience moving around the world with my dogs, it does not stay with dogs, sadly. So she personally, she has not experienced that either. Are some dogs just more, uh, I don't know, they run hotter, basically? So I know Pacey is a dog that just tends to be, like her base temperature is really hot. And does that affect uh, heat stress and stuff? Good question, Sarah. So... Um, Pacey was actually part of our hydration study that we did a couple years ago where we did their baseline temperature and then we put them through a series of exercises and tasks and then we took their temperature afterward and she was one of the dogs that kind of always got the highest. Um, and for the trainers that remember our normal body temperature for a dog, it's 100 to uh, 102.5. So she went up to around 107, 106 consistently. Uh, to the point where Pat can look at her and guess her temperature, uh, her core temperature. So I don't, I don't, can't say that because she is such a high drive, hyperactive dog that she's genetically more susceptible. Um, she also might acclimate just as well, but like kind of had to set as a whole, our high drive dogs, because they're so active, because they're so doing things all the time, they are going to, I guess, be more prone to heat stress. They're going to get there faster because they're doing more. Um, in that study, we did notice that the shepherds conserve their energy, for lack of a better term, better. Um, they were smarter about sprinting. They didn't full out sprint every time, as opposed to the Labradors, we didn't have any Malinois at the time, um, who full out sprinted every single time they possibly could. Um, so keeping the idea of their general activity level and how they work and their basically personality, um, yes, is very important. But again, those pictures of Blitz that you guys saw kind of in the beginning, Blitz will have the most squinty eyes ever and his ears all the way back and his tongue completely hanging out, but he's still not at his level of like heat exhaustion. Um, he gets heat stress and he hangs out there for a while, but he's also pretty well acclimated. So he's one of those dogs that it's, important to kind of keep an eye on because he will work all the time like crazy until he collapses. So taking those little hints in the beginning. Um, and that's also where coming in and watching your dog and understanding their normal um, is very important. I hope that answers your question. Yes, Pat, they trot, trot, trotted. <laughs> For the study that you mentioned, mm -hmm. um, what actually physically changed in the dog after they got heat stroke um, to make them more susceptible to heat stroke again? Like, what is that? Good question. So at heat stroke, it affects all of your internal organs. So your liver, your intestines, your kidney, your brain, your heart. So every time they get to the level of heat stroke, it causes some kind of vascular or physiologic damage to those or organs. And the longer it happens or the longer it takes to recover, the more damage that happens to those organs. So it's just like anything. If you go into something with already having some damage, it's going to be more severe than next time. So those dogs already have compromised organs when they're going to potentially get into heat stress again. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yep. How long between different stages? I'm hearing different for different dogs. So, Helen, yes, it's different between different dogs because there's no guaranteed time frame for when a dog is going to go from stress exhaustion and 
um, stroke. It really all has to do with the factors we already talked about. Is the dog obese? Is the dog um, acclimated to the weather that it's in? Is the dog have any underlying problems like um, airway problems? Or um, if the dog has any heart disease, thing, things of that nature. So each dog is going to be a little different. In Amory's example with Pryor, he was not acclimated to the weather and playing ball in a hot degree weather. I believe it was like a day that was 60 the day before and then it was 80 the next day and he went out to play ball in the middle of the day um, and that progressed very rapidly. There are other dogs, I mean luckily, knock on one, none of our dogs have gotten beyond any of those stages because our trainers and our interns have done such a great job of identifying it earlier. Um, but that dog in the video, I think it was kind of the same thing. It was a change of the weather and they were just playing ball and then all of a sudden the signs were not picked up as quickly and the dog collapsed. So it's not about timing. So it's like once I see one sign, one sign, I have 10 minutes till, you know, the next stage. It's about identifying as many of those early, stopping what you're doing and intervening um, before so that you can stop the progressive stages. There's no set time, kind of like um, bleeding. You have three to five minutes, that type of thing. So, anybody else? And for interns, our trainers are incredibly good at all of this. So if you ever have questions or want to do anything um, extra or understand, they are the people to go to because they're much more accessible than Brian and I. Any other questions? So definitely the things I want you guys to take away from this presentation is it's very important. Um, watching the dogs are critical for those signs that we talked about, the ears, the eyes, the mouth, the panting, the tongue, um, the behavior. Those are all very important. Um, it's preventable. If you don't pick up these signs, bad things can happen to our dogs. We don't want any of that to happen. If something bad does happen and we don't catch it early, soaking them with water down to the skin, getting them out of the sun, into some shade, set, get some airflow, make sure there's fans or people waving towels or the car windows are open so there's air moving through. Those are all very important things. And these are applicable for your own dogs too, not just the dogs at the center. All right, Jenny, good question. At what point do you have to be careful not to cool down the dog too fast? Or this, is that not even a worry? Um, so it is a worry. Uh, dogs should not be cooled beyond the temperature of 103. Um, I, for the most part, if we're intervening and they're at heat exhaustion or heat stress, you kind of go based on, it depends on the dog. If you can take their temperature, obviously take their temperature, that is good. But you don't want to overstress them out so that they get hotter by taking their temperature. For example, blitz. Um, I had to cool him down after one of uh, his exercises outside, and he was not going to tolerate me sticking a thermometer in his butt at the time. So I just went based off of his sign. So when he could pant and then stop panting and uh, gather himself that way, once his eyes looked a little more normal, his ears came forward, uh, all those signs started to kind of resolve. So you can go by either way. Uh, taking their temperature, you wouldn't do it beyond 103. So once they hit a rectal temperature of 103, you would stop. Because if you overcool them, they then can go into hypothermia, which causes a whole other uh, gamut of issues. Uh, for level one training for you guys, if it got to the point where we were treating them with water and we were concerned about overcooling them, you would be talking to a trainer or um, one of the veterinarians and we would help you do that. Um, yeah. Good question. Going off of what temperature water is best to use, ice water versus cool water versus... Okay, so there's a couple of debates on whether ice water is required or cool water is required or even warm water is required. Um, if the dog is not a ICU level patient, as in has very comorbidities, or a infant puppy, as in like, you know, 
the little guys who are a couple weeks old, um, there's no issue with using ice water or cool water. You can use, use whatever water you have at the time because that's the most important. Um, make sure that you're getting them cool and then we can deal about them being colder later. Luckily, you guys don't have to deal with any infant puppies, so that's not really an issue. Um, and none of our dogs are geriatric at that level. Um, so yes, temperature does matter in those cases, but it also matters that you cool the dog anyway so that you're not having the heat stroke problem. So kind of like we talked about with Brian, kind of picking your battles here and there's some compromises of things you're doing. If you only have warmer water or you only have ice water, you use what you have because that's what's important of cooling the dog. And then you can kind of address the second morbidities after that. Thank you, Pat. Is that the same for drinking water or is room temperature best? Uh, Mary, good question. Uh, there's uh, kind of conflicting information. From what I've read for drinking water usually comes out of GDV studies and those are very convoluted in understanding what they are. Um, I know a couple dogs who absolutely hate ice water so they won't drink it. Uh, and then I know other dogs that won't drink room temp water. I don't know if there's any true pros or cons of either one. Um, I think just making sure your dog is able to drink is most important. Uh, Brian or Cindy, I don't know if you guys have any comments on room temp versus cold water for drinking. Every year there's something that goes around on Facebook about dogs dying of drinking ice cubes or ice water. Uh, I don't think there's any evidence for it. Um, I don't know if Brian's got any better information, but um yeah i think that you know cool water is fine dogs like to chew on ice cubes when they're hot that's one of the things that we consider using yeah the drinking water isn't going to save them or not so that's not the priority in the moment getting water on the dog is the priority in the moment temperature of that doesn't matter as long as it's not hot like the first water to come out of a hose i've done that just turning the hose on and blast the dog with hot water out of the hose but once we've got cool or cold water on the dog, then whatever goes the bowl is fine. These are all great questions, guys. Any other ones? Uh, I have a question. Yep. Is uh, there any correlation between how fit your dog is and how fast they progress through uh, heat exhaustion, or is it like strictly individual? Uh, that is a great question of which once we make a fitness assessment to decide how fit a dog is, um, we will be able to hopefully study that. Uh, right now, there's no way to actually kind of gauge how fit a dog is. I would imagine the less fat that a dog has, the better equipped they might be to deal with heat stress, um, since obesity is a... Um, predisposition to have progressed through heat um, related injuries. So uh, from that perspective, it would the only thing we can say right now scientifically is having less fat is decreases the chances of having or the severity of heat injury. But stay tuned for when Brian, Dr. Otto and I make a fitness assessment and then we can study that. Can I ask another question? Yeah, of course. Um, I don't know if Danielle's on. I think she might be able to explain it better than I can. Um, but with the U litter, what we've been noticing as their drive goes up is, I'll use Hugo as an example, we'll be going towards a fit work room and he gets himself so worked up that it appears that he's in heat stress. But this was, you know, in like February. So obviously mm -hmm. he wasn't in heat stress, but the signs looked really similar. And we had to say, no, you can't work because now you just made yourself too hot. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess would the consequences be the same or is it more of like a drive thing than heat or are they kind of related at all with the consequences? Does that make sense? Um, a little bit. Try rewording just a titch. Sorry, you cut out. I couldn't hear you. What? Um, it makes sense a little bit. So are you asking me what we should do? What is... Try again. So since he's showing the same signs as he would be in heat stress um 
can, you know, if it goes, I guess, untreated or if he tries to work in that scenario, would the consequences be the same? Could he be injured in the same way that he could in heat stress? So heat stress is heat stress no matter how they got there. Um, so Blitz being the example, he kind of always hung out in stress or close to stress frequently because that, like you just said, they are they mentally get themselves worked up, which sometimes can be just as close to um, being just out hanging out in the heat. So heat is, it's not just about the temperature outside. Heat means their internal temperature. So what's happening to them as they're going through. Um, so they can mentally work themselves up the same way a person can overheat by having a panic attack. They can get their fever that way. Um, so in the case of the puppies or when dogs are getting really amped up to go do something, um, taking them, so if he was going to fit to work, taking him in fit to work and then letting him be for a little while, you know, not immediately going into jumping into fit to work exercises if that's what you were doing and he was still maintaining those signs, then I would stop. But if he goes into fit to work and he kind of realizes, oh, this is what we're doing, I'm still barking and still acting a little crazy, but I'm not progressing in any of the signs, then I would keep working. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Uh, doing a follow up on that. Mm -hmm. Can you like, I know Blitz has a command to come down a little bit, <laughs> uh, but how successful is that? in uh, like breaking uh, that going from stress to exhaustion to stroke, uh, if you can just teach a command uh, and can that reverse some of it? Um, so in Blitz's example and that like calmingness, I would imagine it doesn't take him to the next level because he's not excessively panting. He's, you know, honing it in, breathing, calming down. Um, I don't know if there are any studies or proof that it helps not progress to the next level. I saw Dr. Otto unmuted herself, so I'm sure she'll <laughs> comment in on here. Um, I don't see how it would hurt. I think it could only help, but Cindy, you got ahead. Yeah, so what? Um, if any of you guys are signed up for the conference, um, I think if you uh, listen to Esther Schalke's um, talk, it's brilliant. It's about the difference between arousal and motivation. Um, and sometimes we're guilty of arousing our dogs, um, which could lead them into these types of sort of free excitement that may set them up. And so I think using approaches that in enhance that calmness is going to improve the safety of our dogs and the performance of our dogs. So I'm really hoping that we can start to think about ways we can incorporate that. And I'd, I'd invite Anne Marie or, or Bob, Bob's probably not on, but you know, any of the trainers who've seen Esther's, um, presentation i just i think it's brilliant yeah i watched esther's presentation and it was incredible um like cindy just said it was about the difference between arousal and drive was that the other word i think she used um and basically what lauren also described of ugo getting aroused to go into the fit to work area and he was you know all, all excited and worked up to get there so basically that's what arousal is um sets our dogs up to be extra excited or, you know, puts them up at a higher level to, to work out. I would imagine it would be like someone being extremely stressed out or an adrenaline rush for something. And then they keep getting impacted with another adrenaline rush of some kind of episode. And it just kind of all snowballs from there. Um, I'd imagine it's kind of the same with our dogs. I loved her presentation. I thought, uh, you know, I just took away so much from it. And I know that we're going to change some of the things we do at the center. It was just great. Great question, Casey um, and Lauren. Megan, to all the uh, questions about um, the heat stress and also that example with Hugo, um, I have a good example. I just wanted to add it uh, was Obi because he was literally just so drivey. Getting him down to the rubble pile from the center was the biggest challenge because he literally would try to choke himself and was so amped up that I literally I couldn't work him right after. Um, so I actually had to find a way of um, not getting him into that heat stress 
by just tugging all the way down to the rubble pile. So that's, I just wanted to add it as a as a good example. That's a perfect example. Thank you for sharing, Alina. I remember you asking me about that, of ways we could cool them down to get there. Um, but it's a prime example of some of the arousal and the difficulties of the high drive dogs, which is why they're listed under um, susceptibilities or predispositions to getting heat stress and heat stroke and um, heat related injuries because they just work themselves up. That arousal is so high they get Urgh, crazy. I'm so glad that's recorded. Judy, don't you dare share that somewhere. <laughs> hmm, I'll think about that. <laughs> <laughs> And yes, Cindy just wrote, or Dr. Otto just wrote in the chat, you can still register for the conference. Um, and I'm sure, like Emery just said, we're going to start implementing some of the things that we learned at the conference because everyone presented some really interesting data um, moving forward. Anybody else? This is a great discussion. Thank you guys for sharing everything too. If anyone else has any other um, you know, stories or input that they want to share, feel free. I don't want to go over anybody's time. I know we're over a little bit by five minutes already. So if anyone wants to jump off, that's also okay. I'll hang around for another, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes if anybody has anything else they want to talk about. <laughs>